One of the biggest takeaways that I ever had in life, and and by the way, listen to this, especially if you're trying to make more money and raise your income. Scientists have studied the biggest factor, what makes people successful, not just with money, but in life in general. And there's a few things. This is part of kind of my 67 steps if you've never been in that program. But one of the things is awareness. And I'm not gonna talk about that now. I've recorded on this, what I learned about awareness. You know, I'm flying home now to the from the farm here by Joel Salatin, my first mentor. I'm flying to LAX. So we're driving to Washington, D.C. to catch a flight. But what I wanted to say is, number two, interchangeably as important as awareness is something called conscientiousness and they kind of blur together so in some ways awareness is a subset of conscientiousness so what I want to talk about for one second is if you want to make more money you raise your conscientiousness not just work harder not just get a better college degree not just get a better diploma piece of paper forget all that I'm going to the core crux of the matter, the heart of the matter, the root of it. And some people are conscientious and some people aren't. And I've never met someone successful that's not highly conscientious, that doesn't have a superpower of conscientiousness. So I gotta explain this, because this is something they never teach in school, no parents really teach their kids anymore. They used to teach this 100 years ago, but it's zero. You learn algebra and dumb stuff that you'll never use in your entire life. Now, maybe you'll learn algebra. 1% of the population becomes engineers. The rest stop teaching calculus in high school. Have you seen kids nowadays? You think they are, can think through life's problems? No. But here's what conscientiousness is. It's four things. And I'm going to add a fifth one. Scientists give it four. I'm adding one. Prudence which means the ability to make wise decisions, prudence. We all have that one friend that's an idiot. If they could they have a choice between two options, they have a choice between dating an awesome person and an idiot, oh, I gotta date the idiot, that's low prudence. There's a choice between two career paths, they pick the stupid one. They have low prudence, so that's the first thing. The second thing is what they call industriousness or diligence. That's working hard when you need to and not being lazy. It's easy to understand. The third one is organization. Organization is not just writing out a to-do list. It's putting it in order. I know a lot of people that write to-do lists and they're all randomly in order. They, the most important thing is last. And so can you organize your day? Can you organize your thoughts? I think that's what the school system thinks math teaches kids. I was super good at math, by the way. It didn't teach me anything about being an organized brain, really. Maybe a teeny bit, you get a 10% boost from being, but forget math. Get common sense and you'll be good. You can pay somebody else to do the math for you. You can pay an accountant. You think I do my own taxes? No. You think I build my own bridges? No, you hire engineers. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing, and this is a big one, is called perfectionism. That means do you double and triple check your work? You know, this world is full of people that just go, they do you give them an assignment they do it and then you're like do you think it's done right and they're like yeah probably no probably check the damn thing if you need if you're kind of stupid and no common sense check it 30 times because you don't have good common sense you better double check more triple check when you get on an airplane you know why there's basically no airplane crashes in the world as a ratio of how many flights there are there's millions of flights and like zero crashes Simple. There's a system called Six Sigma that was developed. Big companies used to use it. Engineers used to use it. And Six Sigma says you only make one per, uh, three mistakes per million actions. And so how do you do that? That seems outrageous. How can out of every million flights, there only be three problems with engines? Not even crashes, just problems. Easy. They create double, triple, quadruple checklists. When you get on an airplane, there's an airplane co-pilot reading off the list, double checking. They don't just take off. They go, all right, check the ailerons, check the um, landing gear, check the electric, check everything, and then double checking. Then people can't figure out why they go broke all the time. I can't, you're not a perfectionist. And also though, just to be clear, Prudence, which we talked about earlier, which is making wise decisions. There's a time when you shouldn't be a perfectionist. 
In fact, most people I know with low prudence, they're perfectionists about idiotic things. They'll have their nails done perfectly. Perfect. They'll have their eyebrows done perfect. Male or female, by the way. I'm not picking on one or another. They'll have their shoes shine perfect, but then their life is in shambles. I'm like, bro, why don't you just have your shoes a little dirtier, but an awesome life? And it's like, oh, what do you mean? Oh, it's supposed to be a perfectionist, you said, Ty. No, perfectionist in important stuff. Like, be a perfectionist with making money. Double and triple, triple check. I knew a guy at a nightclub, and uh, he couldn't figure out why he never made money. I was like, bro, people stealing from you, your employees. Well, I'm like, do you double and triple check? Do you compare the little clicker from your bouncer, how many people walked in the club, to how much money you took home? And if you're charging, we used to charge cover charge. If you're charging 20 bucks and 100 people came through the door, did you ever go, oh, I should have $2,000? No, he was just randomly like, well, it'll all work out. No, it doesn't. It doesn't all work out. People steal from you and you end up making $1,400 because $600 goes out the door to somebody. So, perfectionism. And then, this fifth one. Now, scientists don't have this fifth one, but I've talked to some scientists because I think the fifth one is awareness. So here's situational awareness. I'm gonna give you an example. This is funny. Joel Salatin, my first mentor, you, I don't know if we had a little clip of him earlier, this is an amazing thing about Joel. This, I, I swear I should make this his own video. So, Joel is the most situationally aware person. He's not daydreaming. He's not, you know, going, oh, like he's not planning 33 years out from now. He's paying attention to what he's doing. Now, this save, I've had this save my life before, especially working around heavy equipment. I've had people almost killed that I bring from the city to a farm because they're not situationally aware. We're putting up huge eight foot, 300 pound posts and they're like looking at their phone and we have a little, you know, like a winch holding it up and the winch unsnaps and the pole comes and I'm like, oh my God, pay attention. And here's a story, two stories. One, when I was 19, I was walking through a field with Joel Salatin daydreaming because I was from the city and people in the city <coughs> are told that daydreaming is such a wonderful thing. Yeah, once in a while, if you're Albert Einstein, it is. But even Albert Einstein paid attention to what he was doing in the moment. He came up with the theory of relativity equals MC squared while he was working at the post office 10, a day, 10 hours a day, sorting mail, paying attention. He wasn't, people have this thing like, oh, Stephen Hawking, Albert Einstein, they just lay there and just daydream and let their mind wander. Yeah, sometimes, but not all the time. So I'm walking through this field with Joel. I'm like, la, la. And I'm, I didn't notice there was a gate open and all the cattle were getting out. I'll never forget this. He turned to me. He kind of jolted me. I thought, he raised his voice. Like, I was like, what? He's like, there's a time to stop and smell the roses. And it's right, not right now. Time to stop and smell the roses. And he was saying, this is a time to be aware of where we are. When you're at home and you're laying in bed or you're eating, then you can daydream. Or you're writing a book. You know, but he's like, now pay attention now. And that one thing that I learned from him, I would say is responsible for more of the, all the money I've ever been able to generate with my businesses and in life, it's responsible for 60% of it. That one lesson right there, pay attention. And Warren Buffett, second or third richest man in the world, he says, put all your eggs in one basket and watch the basket. Watch the basket. And the basket is your life. It's your business. It's your career. It's your friendships. Watch it. You know how many people are just like, oh, life will work out on its own. No. There's a universal law. You remember this from physics. You have thermal law of thermodynamics. All this entropy. That means over time, if you have a house and you don't maintain it and you don't paint it, and you don't fix the roof, it, if you come back in 20 years, it's worse, not better. There's never a house in history that's been standing there, someone abandoned it and came back 20 years and you're like, you ain't gonna believe this. There's a deck on here, new cabinets. No, new furniture, no. Entropy means that you have to inject energy, your own energy, your own energy to improve things. 
And so when you're not situationally aware, you're not conscientious, you're not organized, you're not diligent, you're not a perfectionist, you're, you're not somebody who um, is prudent, you're not industrious, all these things, guess what? Your life gets worse and worse and worse and worse and then you can't figure out why your happiness is declining, your income is static, you're stuck in the same dead end. I can tell you why. Joel Salatz had told it to me at 19. You're not watching the basket, you're not paying attention. That's 99% of the world. Another way of saying this is what Sam Chupp, I went and lived with the Amish, who are also very situationally aware. They're connected to the land. They pay attention to what they're doing. And uh, Sam Chubb told me, he said, Ty, there's three types of people in the world. One, makes things happen. The second, watches things happen. And the third, wonders what happened. And he said that kind of with a twinkle in his eye and a little joke, and I realized that's the entire world, the third one. It's okay to not always make things happen. Sometimes you got to watch other people teach you. But that third one should never happen to you. Never wonder what happened. Andrea would never get a ticket and be like, oh, where am I flying? Look at the damn thing. It has the letters right in there. Pay attention to detail. Then you figure it out. It's literally a six-year-old lesson that almost every adult in the modern world has to be taught because the school system and how people are raised without any community, without it. Most people aren't raised with parents. And if they have parents, the parents are just guardians. They're not actually equipping their kids with the mental training that you need to make it and thrive in life. I repeat that. Most people are raised by wolves. That's what I always say. It's like wolves, you know, like if you were left Mowgli, you're left in the jungle and you have like these wolves, they protect you from predators drugs like most parents they keep their kids from you know doing drugs and they keep their kids going to school they keep their kids not just eating cheetos all day like basics but that's what a guardian does you might as well be at an orphanage for that that's what they do at an orphanage where they don't even care about you parents in an ideal world and i'm not saying i had this because my, my dad was in prison when i was born i had to go out and find a surrogate father Guys like Joel Salton, mentors, people like Sam Chubb, and they're the ones. But but you have to go seek them out because they ain't gonna seek you. You think that you think other people are sitting around going, who can I mentor? Hell no. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And when the student's not ready, you ever heard that saying? When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Everybody loves that saying. But what's the op? What's the reverse? The inverse? The opposite? When the student's not ready, the teacher will disappear. Remember that. That's the negative side, but true. The teachers leave when the student's not ready. So you better make yourself ready for this, what I'm talking about now. Be conscientious. Be that person that's reliable. And I'm not doing it in some cheesy way, like give your best. I'm gonna forget cliche. I'm talking about you want to make 10 million bucks? Never met somebody ever. Not once. Who doesn't have attention to detail? So let me tell you this second story about Joel Salatin. You know, I like to collect cars. I've always loved cars since I, my mom said I was used to sneak in the garage when I was under three years old. And I'd try to take a key and put it in the, I would scratch the cars. I'd get in trouble. I was trying to put it in. I wanted to drive. Well, I've always liked cars. So now I, I got a little more money than I did when I was three years old. So I collect cars. And I had this Lamborghini the black one, the smaller one. I have two. I got two Lamborghinis now. And I'm in the city. You would think city people know a lot about fancy cars, right? Because Hollywood. So I had that Lamborghini for like a year. Joel Salatin comes to speak at a conference I have. He flies from a little small town in Virginia to a big city, Los Angeles. I pick him up at the airport. First thing he does, I picked him up. I happened to have the Lamborghini. I wasn't even trying to pick him up in it, but I was like, I don't know, picked up from service shop or something. He walks up to it and he goes, this is an interesting car. And he starts noticing 10 things about that car. He's like, hmm, those are probably like 24 inch, the wheel width. Oh, wait, I see how they put that, that the way that, I forget. I can't even remember what it was. He noticed. He said basically it's an engine on axles. 
on just a frame, and that's why it's so fast. And he talked about it for 10 minutes, and I thought, oh, I got all these people that watch my videos of Lamborghinis, all these kids that are like, we know a lot about cars. Joel, simple farmer, observed more things about that car. To this day, not one person has ever said, and Joel's not even really a car guy. He's just observant. That's situational awareness. Another example, when Mark Cuban was over at my house, some of you, a couple million of you have seen that video. Well, he was at my house for a long time, but I only recorded, I only posted on YouTube like 20 minutes of it. But the most situationally aware person ever walked at my house where I live, where I, my Knowledge Society headquarters of my business in Beverly Hills was Mark Cuban. The dude walked in, he noticed so much stuff, it's hilarious to this day. Now, this is a billionaire, the guy from Shark Tank, the owner of Dallas Maverick. He walked through, he's like, hmm, why does this, why do your doorknobs work like that? I forget what it was exactly, but he meant he, like seven things he noticed. To this day, I just had 350 entrepreneurs at my house. They want to be entrepreneurs. Not one person noticed any of this stuff that a billionaire did. You make money when you're conscient. The dude pays attention. That's why he made, what's he worth? Two, three billion dollars? How'd you like to have $3,000 million in your bank account? I don't know if he's all cash, but that's what his net worth is. It's a lot of money. And he, and he earned it by doing stuff that most people won't do. And we live in a world, it drives me crazy. A lot of you seeing my Instagram and Snapchat now, I'm on my, I got a couple different ranches, farms. Why am I there? Because I gotta get away from it, because it's like poison. You gotta cut out bad social circles that teach you stupid habits. This modern world, just like Sam Chup, the Amish guy told me, three types of people. People will make things happen, people who watch things happen, people who wonder what happened. If at any point in your life, you're wondering, you're like, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I wonder why Donald Trump is president. Figure it out. Figure out the psychology. Quit being a Republican or a Democrat and be an observer of life. God, if I have to hear one more novice give their stupid political views, they know nothing that are, these are people, most people who talk politics, their life is in shambles. I'm like, why do I want to listen to your opinion about a complex entity like running the United States when you can't even balance your bank account, dude? Shut up. Why don't you go try to figure out why things are like they are? More people need to shut up and go start either observing things happen, making things happen, or figuring out why they happen. Figure things out. Joel Salton walked by the Lamborghini. He was trying to figure out why the car said it could go 220 miles an hour. He walked around and was like, dude, this thing's a giant engine with almost no frame. And he noticed very specific things. Like I said, I own it and I still don't know it to this day. And he's not a Lamborghini guy. He has a thousand dollar truck he drives around. You guys saw his yeah. truck, the ugliest truck in America, but he don't care because he's not a perfectionist about his trucks. He's a perfectionist about his land and his business and his family and all the important things and his social life and his health. They don't care about nothing else. Let, let your uh, hair get long. Sometimes my hair is too long. People on, and on YouTube are like, oh, your hair is getting long. Well, that's not the thing to be a perfectionist about. Stop being a perfectionist about how you look. Male and female, the damn Instagram age is going to turn everybody into morons. People are taking 63 pictures to get one that they like. Really? That's what you want to be a perfectionist about in life? You want to look back on your life and go, well, I had a crappy job, crappy career. I was always stressed over money. My social life, my romantic life was in shambles. But you know, my health was in shambles. But you know what I was great at? I always kept my hair good. Oh. Prudence, you don't have the brain power to fathom what I'm saying. That's the world we live in right now. And then people are like, well, the rich are getting richer. It's unfair. Stop complaining and why don't you figure out why do the rich get richer? People say it's not a good, I'm not even saying it's a good thing that the rich get richer, but I'm curious. Stop trying to judge everything. Stop trying to go, well, Donald Trump is a horrible president or Donald Trump is the best president. Try to understand the psychology. How did he get elected? Why did Hillary Clinton lose? What did she do? incorrectly that he did correctly. Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, be curious about life, figure everything out. If somebody sends you a book, read the whole damn book. Or be prudent, if the book's crap, throw it away. 
I meet people who are perfectionists. They're like, Ty, I, the reason I only read one book a month is because if the book is long, I can't move on to another book until I read every page. Why? That's bad prudence. When the book's crappy, I throw them literally in the trash. Or if there's only one good chapter in that book, I read the one good chapter. That's not the perfectionism you want. The perfectionism you want is on important things you double, triple, quadruple check. Not, I know people that I watch them read books. They read the same sentence three times. Stop that. Learn how to read the first time you catch the meaning. And if your brain's too slow, exercise your brain. Your brain's like a muscle. It'll get stronger and faster. Don't wonder what happened. If somebody asks you what happened in World War I, you should be able to give a decent answer. And you might go, well, why does history matter? What matters is that you're observant. World War I wasn't that long ago. You shouldn't understand the basics of World War I, World War II, Vietnam War. You should understand what happened in Iraq, what happened in Syria. You should know the basics. I was on a date once with a girl in Santa Monica. I was like, well, tomorrow I got to fly to Miami. This is an American girl, by the way. And she goes, Miami, where is that? And I was like, this is a grown adult woman. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I think I've heard of that. Is that in Northern California? I'm like, what are the odds? Would you bet, would you invest your money in that person? No. Always think this way when you're trying to figure out the characteristics you have to develop. This is mental toughness. This is mental. People talk about, you know, you got to have the mentality of success, but they always have stupid things like be positive all the time. That's not a mental state that makes you more successful. Being a realist is better than being an optimist or a pessimist. I don't know why. I've been trying to tell people that for years, and it's like it doesn't compute. You have two schools of people in the world. They're either hyper-pessimists, like, oh, the world is so bad, and uh, the rich going to tear from the poor, and Donald Trump's president, and everything's bad, so they're like that. Or they're like hyper-optimists, like, Ty, I will be a billionaire. I'm an idiot now, but I will just... Built, I will envision it. I've spoken it into existence. It will happen. Really? That you're you're fat and you're gonna be like, I will speak skinniness into existence. No, you won't. You go to a damn gym, you'll get a personal trainer, you'll get a mentor, you'll get social circle right where you're around people that go to the gym that so that there's social proof and social pressure on you, and then you'll get shape. It's not pessimist. Some people are, oh, my mom was fat, my dog was fat, I'm just big bone. Now forget that. Stupid. And we live in a world that reinforces stupidity. And then people can't figure out why they don't like their life. You know, depression is functional most of the time. Not always. Dr. David Buss taught me. He's like, there's multiple reasons why you want people to be depressed sometimes. Depression teaches you don't do the thing that made you depressed before. Just like sticking your hand in a fire, you would you want to turn your nerves off? So uh, I, I asked my grandpa, so when I was five years old, I'll, he died a little bit after that. He was a scientist. I said, Grandpa, why do we get hurt? And he said, you have nerves all throughout your body and it connects to your brain and it makes this almost like an electric shock. It's not an electric shock, but it's equivalent. And I was like, well, why don't we just turn them off? Then we could be happy. And he goes, no, that's what leprosy does. There's a disease. When I was in India, I went to a leper colony. They lose the nerves. And guess what happens when you lose nerves? You start bumping into things. You start putting your hand on the fire. That's why most of them lose part. Like in India, there's people with no nose, no fingers is a common thing. Leprosy is more complex than this, but that's one of the things that happens. So we live in a world where people are trying to be like, don't be depressed. Don't have regrets. You hear that, no regrets. What do you mean no regrets? No regrets? Then how do you learn anything? It's a stupid piece. It's like turn off your nerves. Regrets are the mind's emotional nerves. Now, there are people that are hormonally or chemically imbalanced, a percentage, but it's not most depressed people. Most depressed people, it's a continual signal from your brain going, you're living a crappy life. Switch your job, switch your career, switch your social circle, move, take action, stop procrastinating. And most people just ignore it, but the brain keeps sending the signal, 
and I'm not a psychologist, but I'm telling you that Dr. David Buss is an evolutionary psychologist, Harvard professor, now University of Austin, who wrote the textbooks. And I got that word straight from him. He knows what he's talking about. I'm regurgitating what he said. So don't try to argue with me on this. I always get people argue and go, oh, most depression is because it's not their fault. Well, <laughs> I mean, nothing's our fault. I didn't ask to be born. My mom had me. So I guess I could just say everything. I'm like, ah, well, I, it may not be your fault. It may be someone else's fault who did something wrong to you. I get it. But if you don't fix it, you still have a crappy life. And whoever caused the problem, they definitely aren't going to fix it. So you could blame, the, people blame the U.S. economy. Oh, the government's making my life worse. I had a relative like this. He was a little lazy. He didn't have a job. He was broke. And he goes to me, well, I said, why don't you get a job? He goes, I can't. The government is, he is a conspiracy theorist. So I'm like, well, okay, let's say you're right. Let's say it is the government that's holding you back. You have, and you hate your life now because you're broke under financial pressure. So I go, so as far as I can tell, are you waiting for the government to fix it? Because you just said they're the problem. That's like going to a doctor. They screw up the surgery. You're like, oh, I'm in pain. And I'm like, what are you going to do about it? Oh, it's that damn surgeon. Okay, what are you going to do about it? Oh, I'm going to go back to the same surgeon. I'm waiting for that surgeon to fix it. That surgeon ain't going to fix it. If he's stupid enough to leave the utensil in you, go back to a different person. To who I wouldn't go back to the same doctor. There's doctors that are don't pay attention. They chop people's wrong foot off in surgery or, you know, remove the wrong organ. I wouldn't go back to that person. So if you're blaming the government for your financial problems or you're basically blaming the education system, which by the way is to blame, you can't expect it to fix it. People hate the modern education system and then they go to college, which is the modern education system. And sometimes it works and a lot of times it doesn't. So I'm like, why would you go back to the same? You know, Albert Einstein said, you can't solve a problem with the same mentality that created the problem. Einstein, the dude was smart. Listen to him. Forget what I'm saying. I'm not as smart as him. You can't solve. So if the education system caused your problem, you have to go outside of it to fix it. If that's why I went to mentors instead of college, because I had already gone to high school and I realized I wasn't equipped with all the life skills and the mental skills and the financial training and all those things that I needed to make it in life. So I didn't learn about <coughs> habits. How come the school doesn't teach about habits? All your life basically hinges on habits. There's a great book on this called The Power of Habit. And it's a, it's a scientific book, but I can summarize it for you. Basically, the quality of life is based on your habits. Your brain is, is created or, or uh, adapted to quickly fall into habits for a good reason. There was a guy, I think it was in the 1800s, he had an accident, he hit his head real hard, and he destroyed the part of his brain that could form habits, good or bad. And he couldn't form a habit. And he had the worst life because every day he would go put his shoes on, for example, look down at his shoes and go, well, do I do the right one or the left one? And he had to spend two minutes thinking about it. Normal people who don't have brain damage, we create a habit. You probably don't realize it, but you have a habit probably of how you put your shoes on. You know, maybe you put your right, and, and that's a time saver for your brain, an energy saver. It saves glucose. Glucose is the sugar in your brain, and your body wants to conserve it. So we're built, we're adapted to quickly fall into habits. So all of your life quality or your white life suffering is around mental habits. That's why two people can go through the same bad life and one thrives and one fails because of the habits that they form. And so everything I've talked about today, like to be aware, that's a habit. Joel Salatin is not just aware when there's a Lamborghini. He's aware when there's a huge post about to fall down. He's not daydreaming and going, oh, I wonder, oh, life. My, they said enjoy life and smell the roses. Yeah, smell the roses until you get smashed. No. Smell the roses when it's time to smell the roses and focus on now when it's time to be in the now. 
And the only people that kind of talk about this are like Eckhart Tolle books like The Power of Now or I meet people going, oh, I meditate to stay in. That's not what it means, by the way. Situational awareness. I know more weird people that meditate. Now, I do think meditation is good, but it ain't It's a. It ain't going to fix as much as people think. It, it helps some people. Dolph Lundgren, the guy who was in Rocky IV and, and Expendables, you know, the famous actor... I'm friends with him, and he told me that meditation has helped him a lot, but it'll only take you so far, and doing yoga only going to take you so far, trust me, you know one thing, that's like saying you chop your arm is cut, and all you need is one band-aid, you might need a lot of stitches, meditation might be one stitch, yoga might be one stitch, there's a lot of stitches to fix problems. I cut my eye once playing basketball. A guy slammed into me. I took a charge. And I forget. It's in my eyebrow. My hair still doesn't grow back in part of my eyebrow. I got like 25 stitches. The doctor wasn't like, one stitch. It's a big cut. You need a lot. So people trying to, again, people aren't aware. They go, well, I meditate with Headspace app. And I'm going to solve all my crazy problems. No, you're not. That's one stitch. It's a good one, but it ain't enough. You got to do 20 things to fix these problems. So, practical takeaways. Be curious about everything. For example, here's a test. I'm going to test you right now listening to this. Most people, and I'm assuming you, you look at your keyboard on your laptop or your computer a lot. Okay? Okay. So I'm going to ask you this question. What is F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6, F7, F8, F9 do? What do those all do? And I bet you can't. I, I, I bet you zero people will watch this video or listen to this audio and be able to answer all of those. No, I shouldn't say zero. I'll be a realist. One per 10,000. So let me get this straight. You look at something. But you never take the time to be curious enough and go, why did they put the F1, F2 there? Why'd they put it there? I've done this at conferences where there's hundreds or thousands of people. And I, I see people Googling it to try to look smart, but nobody knows the answer right away. What's F5 do? What's F6 do? There are keyboards on your... You people use their keyboard freaking 30% of their entire life. And they don't know shortcuts. They don't know how to switch tabs. They don't know how to close. So, the practical thing, pay attention, be curious, be a perfectionist when it's called for, and be smart with decisions and know when it's not called for. Do I get off here and say? Um, 1.6 miles. 1. 6 miles. Pay attention to now. Don't listen to the orthodoxy that tells you you are a little flower and everything's perfect and you are a unique sun petal or whatever the damn rain snowflake and all life will just magically work out for you entropy baby law of the universe you know what's more important than some your mom cuddling you and giving you false advice don't cross the laws of the universe ever you, you want to set up a guarantee for a bad life be like mom law of gravity doesn't apply to me when I was a teenager this girl I know at my church was dating this whack job guy and the dude was trying to show off to the girl I know I won't say her name in case she's listening so he climbed up a telephone pole to show off he was a little drunk I think and went to hang out on the wire don't even ask me what this was in this joker's head I think he wanted to show he could like hang or I don't know what he was doing you want to know another thing that reminds me of this truck, point of this truck? This dude, you know, you've been alive that many years, you don't know how to get on an on-ramp. It's hilarious. This, I'm going to prove this to you. Driving bring, shows you what people's mental state is at. So, next time you're on the freeway and somebody is getting onto the highway, watch how people struggle. There's people that will come and go the same speed as you and be like, hey, get over. Well, you're not supposed to change. They're supposed to change. Go faster or go slower. It's crazy how few people know that. If you can't get around somebody, hit the damn brakes and come behind them. This dude here almost crashed into that car because he couldn't press the gas or press the brake. Don't show his face. <laughs> oh, 
blur that out. I don't want to embarrass the guy. But you think I'd invest money in that guy if I saw him driving like that? Hell no. I'd be like, this dude doesn't have common sense. He's not ready. He might be ready. People change sometimes. People improve. But a lot of times people get worse. Entropy. Entropy. If he doesn't inject mass, let's watch this car. Same thing. This joker going to go the same speed. So I have to get over in another lane. Bro, if you have a slow car, press the brakes. If I'm going 55, go 35. Yeah. Like I said, the more I learn about people, the more I like my dogs. The more I learn about people, the more I want to go back to my farm. That's the only thing I hate. I like the city some things, but dude, you want to LA, 12 million people. What percentage of those people have their head screwed on straight? What percentage of those people were trained in life? You gotta be trained. There's never been a Navy SEAL who was good Navy SEAL without being trained. There's never been a martial artist that wasn't trained. There's never been a UFC fighter. There's never been a business person that wasn't trained by somebody, by someone else, by the way. All you self-sufficient narcissists who are like, I learned through trial and error, just go out and do it. I thank you for your service because you're easy to beat in business. <laughs> All you people, I don't need to read, I have to learn on my own. Bad prudence. You got no brain power. You got no, well, you got brain power. I know a lot of smart PhDs that have no common sense. You learn everything from other people. That's how you learn English. That's how you learn manners. That's how you learn how to walk. You observe others and you ask some questions and you learn by osmosis. Driving, boy, driving tells you everything. Go drive in LA. You're like, okay. This, you know, everything's a microcosm. Everything small is a like a microcosm of the big. Do you want to understand why Donald Trump's president? Meet a hundred Americans in states where he won. You want to understand Hillary Clinton? Go to a microcosm, a small version of her voter base. Go to a Democratic state and meet 10 people who you knew would vote for her. Then you'll start to understand, oh, they're this kind of person. They have this kind of occupation. They have this kind of worldview. They have this perspective. They see, you know, government in this way. Observe everything. Understand. That barn right there, that's a hit roof barn. Why did they build hit roof barns? Why? You know, most people, this is an interesting thing. I'm not that religious, but I, I, there's a lot of, of wise things in religious books, scriptures, you know, sacred documents. And one of the things um, that I remember is Jesus Christ said, in order to get eternal life, in order to get the kingdom, okay, you have to be born again. And then somebody asked him, but but Jesus, how can a person be born again? Is he going to go back into his own mother's womb and be reborn? And see, the guy didn't get what... See, that was a guy that was wondering what happened. He didn't understand what Jesus was saying. And again, I'm not a spiritual teacher or anything, but I get it. It took me a long time, and then it clicked one day. I said, he was saying to get what you want. Now, he was talking about whatever, heaven or the kingdom, but think of it this way. To get this prize that you want, and everybody has different goals, to get the goal, you have to be born again. Now, you have to be like childlike. What does it mean to be childlike? What does a little three-year-old ask you over and over? Why? Why? And most parents suppress that in their kids. They're like, don't ask so much why. Don't say that to your kids. Encourage your kids to say why. Because the person who says why at the right time, there is a wrong time to do it. Like when somebody's, you know, on an airplane, you don't turn to people next to you and go, why is this plane in the air? <laughs> why am I sitting? But notice everything. You notice that this road right here, it's crowned in the middle. You know why it's crowned in the middle? Because it rains a lot here on the East Coast and the water that way runs off. If you don't crown it in the middle, it'll pool in the middle and you'll get puddles. Why? Sometimes I've asked myself, why is that grassy median right there? Why did that looks like it's about 30, 
ish feet, maybe 25 feet. Why they pick 25? And in some places, it's only two. Pine trees right there in front of me. Why do pine trees not lose their leaves in the winter? And regular trees do. I can name every tree in there. People drive by trees, ask what they are. It's because I went through a point in life, I was like, I'm gonna find out what every tree is. That's a willow's tree right there. I can also name almost all those grasses. Those are sedges right there, those ones sticking up. That's bull thistle right there. There's fescue and orchard grass and plantain and burdock, and that's a sumac tree. Pay attention. It doesn't have to be just about nature. That's how you make money. That's how you also impress people. People always ask me, how do you get a mentor? Uh, don't be stupid. First rule. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And when the student's not ready, the teacher will disappear. So if you're stupid, and here's the definition of stupid. I'm not talking about book smart. I'm talking about if you drive by the same thing every day of your life and you never ask a question why, that's a locust tree. It's a legume. Do you know what a legume is? People should know what a legume is. You eat them. Beans are legumes. Why are they important? They fix nitrogen from the air. Understand, pretty much, don't wonder what's going on in your life. Like I was telling you earlier, why did the rich get richer? Because most people look at that as like some conspiracy theory. No. 2,000 year old principle. Jesus Christ said this 2,000 years ago. He said, the person who has, more will be given to them. And the person who doesn't have, even what they don't have will be taken away from them. Now, I'm not saying that's good or fair. Forget good or fair. It's the way it is, damn it. Is it fair that a lion eats a sick antelope and the antelope doesn't get to go to the hospital? Does it, I don't, where's all the damn people complaining about that? That doesn't seem fair to me, but we don't live in a world that's fair. We live in a world that has a natural progression and a natural order. I'm not saying you shouldn't help the poor. I think you should. I'm not saying you do the rich should just get rich and 10 people should all know everything in the world and everyone else should be serfs. No, but I also know this. Who the hell are you complaining to that the rich are getting richer? If you're mad, the rich control government. So are you gonna appeal to government that's run by rich people to make it so rich people won't stay rich? Come on, man. Do you think rich people are gonna vote themselves worse taxes? No. No. They're gonna vote themselves better taxes. And there's some countries that pull it off, socialist countries, Sweden, Norway, Europe. But if you're in Europe, be like, wait a second. We're not like America, and everything isn't perfect. So maybe the problem, maybe socialism doesn't fix everything. I mean, people in Sweden or whatever, and people are like, just gun control, controversial topic. Quit picking sides and really research it with an open mind. I don't even, I mean, what, I, I'm not gonna say, I don't, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna influence, I have my opinion, but try to research it. Don't just pick a side. That's a mental laziness habit. Low diligence levels, meaning you don't, low <laughs> diligence, going back to conscientious, means you won't look into things multiple steps. So if things are not working for you, You'll try once, but you won't try, try again. You know, if you can't figure out why the rich are getting richer, figure it out. If you're trying to figure out gun control, don't read one article. Read books by both sides. Call up the NRA. Be like, yo, this seems crazy. Am I missing something? You know, and if you're if you're a gun rights person, call up the anti-gun people. Wouldn't you rather live in a world where people look at both sides before making their stupid decisions? God, people, I had somebody the other day, say, I won't say who, go, well, it's my opinion. You should respect that. Why? Do you think opinions are should be all respected? Should I respect the 9-11 bombers' opinion that they should blow themselves up? Hell no. Should I respect that? Why? Opinions mean nothing. You should respect what's true, and that's all that matters. And the rest is just noise and freaking static that ruins everything. No, no, no. Stop thinking your opinions are valid. Earn the right to have an opinion. Charlie Munger says, you should not allow yourself 
to have any opinion that you can't argue the other side better than the other side can even argue for themselves. So you shouldn't be able to be anti-gun control in his opinion. I mean, uh, pro-gun control, unless you can argue the NRA side better than the NRA. You want to solve all world problems, all strife, all war, all dissension, all divorce? What Charlie Munger said. You know why most people get divorced? Because they can't see the other person's side of the story because they're so narcissistic and so into their worldview that they can't fathom that someone else has one. You know why there's war? Because, you know, North Korea and South Korea can't sit down and be like, yo, let's work this out. Maybe they will now. But all war, Germany, World War I, Hungary, they can work it out with, you know, Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia. They just Baltic War again. And it created Adolf Hitler. And then World War II. People couldn't work it out because everybody, Adolf Hitler, talk about a dude that couldn't see other people's side of the story. His best generals, Rommel, he had him killed at one point because Rommel didn't agree. He gave him honorable death. They came to his house, this, the SS, and they gave him poison. And they said, we're either going to come in there and kill you in front of your family or you can take an honorable death. And Rommel, I think he took cyanide. He killed his best general because Adolf Hitler couldn't fathom that other people's opinions might be right. But he lost the damn war. His guys told him he invaded Russia. And his guys were like, no, it's too cold. The winter, we have to go in earlier. He didn't go in till like May. And Russia gets cold fast. Napoleon made the same mistake. But the other mistake that Adolf Hitler made, well, a big one, he could have invaded England early when he probably could have conquered England, which means Germany probably would have won World War II. All his generals, it's a true story, all his generals were begging him. We're here, we can see England, there's no one here to oppose us. Adolf Hitler sitting back in Berlin, Germany, he's like, no, I don't think it's, I think it's a trap. They're like, it's not a trap, but the dude couldn't listen. So that was probably good, actually, for human history, that that dictator was somewhat moronic, you know? But I think I, he caused the death and displacement and casualties of 250 million people. My grandma included was still alive. My grandma talks about World War II every single day. It affected her that much. And she escaped on a boat. The day, she was on a boat to America the day that the Germany invaded Poland. People, but a lot of people in this world have that same cognitive bias that Adolf Hitler had. Just can't look into things. Like Adolf Hitler or any general should ask his other generals, hmm, that seems opposite than I'm thinking, but what makes you say that? Those are magic words. You write that sentence down. When someone says something that you don't think is correct and you know they're a smart person, now if they're an idiot, you can ignore it. But if they're a smart person and they have an opposite belief of you, what you should do is go, hmm, that sounds opposite of what I was thinking. What do you know that I don't know? What do you know that I don't know? Those are the magic words of life, man. You meet some rich person and they're making more money than you and instead of going off into your rant about wealthy ruining the world, why don't you ask them, hey, what do you know about making money that I didn't learn? Like, I swear, you go ask 10 people that, <laughs> you're going you make more money this month, this week maybe. You ask 10 people who know how to make money, yo, what do you know that I don't know? They'll start telling you stuff. They'll start revealing their inner secrets that they hardly told anybody. <coughs> ask. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will open up. Don't be stupid. I guess is what I'm trying to say in this whole video. Don't be stupid. And then everything gets fixed. And it's not book smart or book stupid. I love books, but that's not the determinant. That's not the driving factor. The driving factor is your mentality. Your mindset, your worldview determines everything. That's why two people can be born into poverty and one rises out and one doesn't. That's why, you know, I read a book once that blew my mind and it was Helen Keller's book. Let me just explain this lady's story if you forgot. Helen Keller. Now I know 
I wasn't born into a great situation. My dad was in prison. My mom's a single mom. Um, we're in kind of a rough part of Los Angeles, Long Beach. Helen Keller is born. She can't hear. She can't see. She can't speak. Okay. Three big things. Hear, see, speak. She's born basically. She got a, when she was 18 months, she had a fever, like meningitis or something. That's what caused it. She's in, somehow, I, I can't remember, unfortunately, this full story, but I think she was somehow abandoned by her parents or left to, like, caretakers. This is before there was Braille. This is before that people cared about handicapped people. Now you have a lot of support for handicap. We're talking, you know, 1800s. They thought that it's just, like, afflicted. They're going to, like, leave her. So she goes. She struggles, obviously. She can't communicate. She's in darkness. She can't. She can touch things. That's it. This lady writes more books than you or I have written. Just, just let that sit good for a second. She writes more books than you or I have written combined. I promise you. I think she wrote, I don't know, at least three books. She can't see, hear, or speak. She created her own language called Braille. And then I meet people who are like, Todd, you, you don't even know what I've gone through. I'm like, bitch, have you been through what Helen Keller went through? No? Okay, well, she rose up out of it. So shut your mouth and go do stuff. That's what I feel like saying. I don't always say that. And, and to myself, I say that too. Sometimes I feel sorry for myself. I'm like, Ty, don't be a bitch of your own brain. Helen Keller wrote three books and couldn't see. What's your excuse? What is your excuse? Just ask yourself, in light of those new circumstances, what are you complaining about? What's wrong? Your mommy didn't tuck you in enough? The government didn't send you a big enough check of other people's money that earned it and they're not sending it to you? Oh, oh my God, tragedy. Forget Helen Keller. We should put you a damn pedestal and be like, no, you want to know true suffering? Let me show you true suffering. This person here. And some people, I'm not downplaying trauma. I've had trauma in life. I've had BS happen to me in childhood and growing up, and you probably had it. I'm not downplaying that, but I'm a realist. It ain't as bad as Helen Keller. Would you trade with her and be like, all right, no trauma, but no be no eyesight, no uh, vocal cords, or I don't know if she had vocal cords or something was wrong, and no hearing. Would you trade? No. She had the, that's about as much trauma as you get. People, it's funny too, people complain how unfair the world is and that the rich are getting richer, they never think that they're actually rich compared to the 40 million kids in India. Where are you giving your money? Who you get? Did you send a check to Indian kids? No, but you're complaining about how unfair it is for you. If you make 30 grand, there's a lot of people in India who make $14 a month. So $14 a month, they make roughly 250. 250 a year, okay? 250 a year. So if you really cared about how unfair the rich and the poor is, you're rich. If you have an iPhone or a laptop and you're watching this, you're rich. So before you complain about the rich, why don't you do a comparative analysis and start sending checks to AIDS orphans in South Africa or, or in the southern part of Africa? There's countries in Africa where there's little kids and that ain't their fault. Little kids are innocent. And they're born, you know, you got countries where you have... 30 to 50 percent HIV rate. I don't see all these people who. So I said, stop complaining. Do something. Stop complaining. I meet all these people that are like environmentalists. I don't see you on a farm. Really? You really care about the environment? Buy a damn piece of land and go fix it. That'll take hard work though. That's a lot harder than yabbing your mouth. You're a vegan and you don't think there should be, you know animals we'll, we'll go grow a huge garden and go feed your whole block with good vegan food then i'll respect you I, what do i have to respect you just because you have an opinion i'm not saying what's right or wrong i'm just saying you're vegan you're an environmentalist i don't see you out there go pick up trash on your street how many vegans in la that i gotta be around and no offense to vegans i know great vegans and i know annoying ones but i know great meat eaters and i know annoying ones too but i'm just saying if you have a heavy stance on something back it up that's what i mean by don't be stupid do you have any situational awareness if you really care about the environment driving even a prius ain't good for the environment either you think the solution to uh improving the land is we should just drive priuses around still burning gas 
Ride a bicycle then. That makes more sense. Ride a bike. Ride a bike everywhere. Then I'll respect, I'll respect that environmentalist. I met a guy once, his name was Eben Haas. He came and visited the Amish. He did not believe, he believed that the system was corrupt, that oil was being done by large companies exploiting countries for oil. So he refused to get in any car, any vehicle, any mode of transportation that had gas. He walked from Massachusetts to Virginia to meet where we were. I respect that guy. He has a strong opinion, but he backs it up with action. He doesn't just babble and sign online petitions. Oh my God. The work and the struggle of all those people who sign online petitions. I'm not saying you shouldn't sign an online petition. I'm just saying, you think you're going to solve the world problems by online petitions? Things that are easy don't change the world. Mahatma Gandhi wanted to end British colonialism in India in the 19, I think it was the 40s, when he was assassinated, late 30s, early 40s, and you know what he did? He said, none of us buy any clothing from England, but they said, but there are no clothes to buy, and he said, then make your own, and he started showing people how to make their own clothes. See, he put action. All great people that have changed the world put action. They didn't complain that Martin Luther King Jr. didn't go, the world's unfair, I'm black, it's unfair. He went out and organized, and he thought it through how to do it in an effective way. Malcolm X too. And whether you agree with everything they did or not, Gandhi, whatever, at least you can respect them. You know, it takes a lot of guts to do what those people did fight the system. It, they didn't sign online petitions that someone started or forward an email chain. What'd you do for the cause? Uh, I went to my laptop and I pressed my mouse here and I pressed forward and I forwarded it to 10 friends. I mean, that's kind of good. And I'm not saying that it's not good to spread messages, but it's not the core solution. It's a band-aid. It's not going to solve the main solve the main problem. You're going to have to do something for real. Don't complain about you hate your job. Just quit it. That's what you do. Just quit. And people go, I can't. I might go broke. Well, then go broke for a little while. Take the pain and then go, I'll never get in that situation again. Get depressed. It's good. You should be depressed every once in a while. In fact, I read a book. I forget the name of this. It's a scientist who studied brain, mental habits, I think it's on my website. I'll try to remember it. But he said you should be sad and depressed about 25% of your life. 15 to 25. Because if you're depressed and sad less than that, that means you're not learning from your life lessons. And if you're depressed more than that, so that means like, you know, one day a week shouldn't be the greatest day of the week, but it should be a learning day. Maybe you're under stress because you're in a group where you're the dumbest person, that's stressful. Once a week, be in a room where you're the dumbest person in the room because it's the only way to learn. You have to be dumber than the people around you. That's how you get smarter. Once a week, be in the gym with somebody so much stronger than you that you're fully intimidated and you're very looking at your body like, yo, what is wrong with me? Like, yo, I'm fat, I'm out of shape. Gets, and if you're in great shape, find somebody that embarrasses you. Do you want to make a million dollars? Find somebody who would be embarrassed to make a million dollars in a year and spend time around them. And then you'll learn. Law of 33%. It's a video I did, a TEDx talk that I did a couple years ago. All Everything that I'm telling you in this, you're not going to learn in school, but it's so common sense that it's impossible to argue with. And I'm not saying because I said it. I'm taking a lot of these principles I've learned from my mentors. So if you argue with me, you're arguing with a lot of smart people. You're not just arguing with me. And I'm not saying I'm always right, but I'm saying so far in my life, I look back at the core principles I learned from people like Joel Salatin, Alan Nation, you know, or situationally from guys like Mark Cuban. I can't think of a time that, that those core principles were ever remotely wrong. And I can think of thousands of instances when they're right. So stop fighting this kind of stuff. Just go, yep, that makes sense. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to simplify. I'm going to start paying attention. 
How far apart do they put the I-beams on that bridge? It's a great way, is literally look at everything. You know, what's RES do? Don't be driving in a car that you don't know what the buttons do. Next time you're on a web page, click every button. You go to Amazon. Today, I was buying something on Amazon. I went to my account and I just started clicking through all of them because I was kind of like, I wonder what all these do. I just wanted to know. That's what you gotta do. Just check every one. Every single one. I'm gonna get off here and grab some food. Every one. If you got a boyfriend or girlfriend who broke up with you, don't be, don't just cry. Make a list, be organized. What do I think are the seven main reasons that they broke up with me? Oh, okay, I was too jealous. I was too controlling. I was too annoying. I, okay, then buy a book on all those subjects. How to be less jealous. How to be less annoying. Ask 10 smart people who aren't annoying. Yo. I think I just got broken up with my, my ex uh, because I was annoying. How can I be less annoying? And then do what they say. Literally do what they say. Do what they say. And then if it doesn't work, ask 10 smarter people or more common sense strong people, not just book smart. North 17, you know, sometimes when I drive on roads, I pull up the Wikipedia for the road. 42 is a road that runs through one, two of my farms. And I was like, what's the origin? I remember Googling it. It was a, it was interesting. It made my life more enriched. When I drive down the road, I understand it. Understand that Jeep right there. Who owns Jeep? How much revenue does that company make? You want to make more money? Start figuring out company. How much does Jeep make? Who knows off the top of their head? No stuff, no stuff, four by four. What's, why is four wheel drive better? Do you understand the physics? Google it. Here's the sad thing. Everything I'm asking you to do used to be hard to do because you just have to go down to the library, check out a book and find this out. Now it's on Google and nobody's, it's amazing. Now there's Google and people know less than they did before Google. They really do. I think maybe it's just like, you're like, oh, I don't need to know anything. I can just Google it. Well, you have to hold some stuff in your brain as the raw materials to making smart decisions. If everything's on Google, you don't have enough in your subconscious. Fill up your subconscious with understanding the world. You know, understand right there. Why in that flat area is the soil better than at the top of the hill? Why do locusts grow so much in Los Angeles? I mean, in, in Virginia here. Speed limit, 55. It's actually interesting why they set the speed limit at 55. For every one mile an hour, you lower the speed limit. Um, this many thousand people less die. So in the world, we basically make a compromise. We go, we'll set the speed limit to 55, knowing that more people will get killed every year, but we're more productive because we can get where we need to go. So it's interesting. There's whole people who devote their life to transportation and going, should I set it to 55? And sometimes I'll set it to 65 and 70. Understand why it's that way. If you see a movie, go to Box Office Mojo. Find out what the budget is and how much revenue. Don't just be like someone like, oh, I'm in my fantasy. Figure out the business behind it. That trucking company, Purdue. Purdue. Why does this company right here control more food than almost any country company in America? Purdue started in 1920. Google it. They have a freaking Purdue.com. And people go, Ty, I'm too busy to do all this bullshit. You too busy to make money? Because this is how you make money. When I meet people that don't know stuff too much, that they're like a deer in headlights, and they're like, oh, well, I know. They have no chance to get what they want, which is a sad thing. It's not like I take it happiness. I'm like, damn, I feel bad for this person. What's wrong with them? Why do they put those little markers on the side? Easy to figure out. Wakes you up. How much weight can that Foster's truck hold? I just had two trucks bring me compost. Each of them held, I think they held 79,000 pounds when you counted the truck. 80,000, you know why 79,000 pounds? Because there's laws in Virginia that you destroy the roads when your truck is over, I think 40 or 45 tons is the most that a truck does. This is all information that you could hold my brain. I'm smart, but you 
could hold the information too. You're probably smarter than you think. You just got dumbed down by the system. It's a walnut tree. Why do walnuts grow here and not pecans? Frank was asking that. Pecans in Virginia, the part of Virginia that's up in the mountains, it doesn't have enough BTUs. Why are BTUs important? They're heat units. And they determine your growing. You need a minimum amount of BTUs. That's why you can't grow certain things here, like oranges. That's why corn grows better when it has a lot of moisture and a lot of heat. You have the big leaf. You should understand. By the way, start with biology because biology is the fundamental of life. And I don't mean biology books, weird stuff. I mean like actually understand the common sense thing. Why is there kudzu on there? Where'd kudzu come from? And you know what's weird is if I had this conversation with 99% of planet Earth, it's like I'm speaking another language. People don't know what tear weight is. That's tear weight on there. Meaning, you know, you have gross weight and then of the truck and then what's on there. Understand as much as you can about the world and the next thing you know, the world will start making sense. And once the world starts making sense, then you can make sense of your life and you can fit the pieces of the puzzle together. So I'll end by saying this. Remember, life is a puzzle and the purpose of life is to put the puzzle pieces together. There is no other purpose on this planet Earth. I can't tell you what happens after we die, but I promise you this. If problems freak you out, if putting puzzle pieces together freaks you out, you'll never be truly alive a day of your life. You'll be a zombie. Just like Thoreau said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. What's called resignation is confirmed desperation. Most people, or as Plato said, most people live in a dark cave. They never see reality. Open your eyes up, and the next thing you know, you'll be happier, healthier, wealthier, and you'll have better friendships and better love and better connections. You'll be fulfilled. You won't be as depressed. You won't be as overweight. You'll have more muscle. You'll have more money in your bank account. You'll have more freedom. You'll be traveling more. You'll be around better people. The people who screw you over will slowly disappear out of your life because they won't be able to keep up with you. And all that'll be left will be a life that's like gold. You put the fire to gold and the only thing left is pure gold. All the rest of the not pure metals disappear. Put your life to the fire. Just try it for the next 67 days. That's the minimum habit uh, forming time frame according to modern science. By the way, a little shameless plug. If you want to, if this helped you out and you want a more in-depth version of this, go watch and join my 67 steps program. I launched it in 2014. Over 150,000 people have gone through it in the last few years. That's more than most universities. I've gotten so many testimonials, I kind of gave up saving them. But if I walk down the street in a city every day, somebody comes up to me a random street every day, if not more than one, and says that 67 steps changed my life. I also launched a follow-up version it's 67 videos like this but more in depth subject by subject 67 things you need to know to get what you want out of life the other thing I recently launched you'll see this on my website is the 12 foundations so if you're listening and you've never been through any of my stuff you can go through the 67 steps if you've already been through the 67 steps and you want to go to the next level go and click on the link tylopez.com my 12 foundations program and uh, it's a newer one it's more uh, it's like my most up-to-date things the 12 things that you are foundational to know for to have the right mindset 67 steps start there uh, and then if you've already once you complete that move on to the 12 foundations it's kind of like a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and then I got some PhD level stuff but you got to go through those two first and then I have other stuff. So, tylopez.com. I hope this was helpful. We gotta stop and eat before Mark has a heart attack. <laughs> Comb them back there. Need a little B-roll. <laughs>